I've been away these last two years. I was uh, at the University of Edinburgh, and I got back, and I do a journal for a policy studies organization called Arts and International Affairs, and that's the flyer that I just handed you. And I was in touch with uh, Daniel, Rahima, Gabby. They're all officials here at PSO. Uh, think of convening a panel that would be related to our journal, Arts and International Affairs, and I'm happy to talk to you about it after the panel if, if, you, if you have a potential contribution that you may want to make. I know Rene has uh, uh, published an article in our journal, which came out of a Facebook post, and then I asked Rene to expand that into a full-fledged article. Uh, so the idea was to convene something here, in, in, and I thought the place where my colleagues would converge would be the word digital, if I attach that next to creative, because we all work in digital spaces. And as it turns out, we're going to have to be very flexible in our definition of the digital, because my colleagues, and, and me included, we took the word creative really seriously. Seriously, <laughs> but our papers sort of deal with the digital, and that's because all three of us are, in some ways, scholars of the digital global political economy. So it'll be sort of interesting to. This is the first time I've been on a panel where I just took it for granted that that would be the word that would, you know, cut across all three of us, and it does. But in our presentations, that's the part that we had to really think hard about. So maybe in our discussion, we can we can spend more time speaking of what are the digital implications of, of these sort of creative endeavors that we will all be talking about. Renee's going to be talking about these images of militarism and patriotism, etc. I'm going to be talking about art and its potential for universal norms and the way that it can't fulfill them. And then um, uh, Irene is going to be presenting her work on the model that she's developed for measuring soft power. So I'll leave it at that, but I encourage you to go online and take a look at the journal. It's uh, we have print versions, but I actually discourage the the print version because that's meant for the libraries. They want the print version still. Uh, it really is a multimedia journal, so it's multimodal, I should say, and and so the full fledged effect of the journal is really sort of uh, online because of the videos, the audio, and the pictures, etc., that are embedded on it. So I'll hand this over to Renee. So how about we speak for fifteen minutes at the Something most? Something like that. Yeah. Just right. cut me off when I, I'll probably speak for less. Um, I'm having a problem with my mouth hurting and so uh, it's it's kind of difficult to articulate and talk. So my idea is to speak for less. The actuality of that may not be the case. Uh, I got interested in this in the images of militarism that I kept seeing, not just in the digital world, but in society at large, in person and online. And it seemed to me that somehow there is some kind of a push from the digital into the in-person world that is accelerating the way in which the military, the images of the military are popping up in our lives. When I started thinking about this, I started talking with some of my more conservative friends and colleagues, including an active duty colonel. And their response was, wait a minute, what you're doing is you're talking about images of patriotism. And there's nothing wrong with that. Patriotism is a good thing. And then on the other side, more recently, we saw, for example, in Charlottesville, images of extreme nationalism and white nationalism in particular. And those were very militaristic images. And so the question was, well, what's that? And how are these things all mixed up together? And so I've been thinking about this notion of militarism and, and, and how it's distinct from, from uh, nationalism and patriotism and how that works into a particular kind of affective information flow that can be a site of power. So that's what I'm going to talk about. I'll go through each of those. So I'm going to talk about 
this, this distinction between militarism connected to nationalism and patriotism. I'll talk about information as an information flow. I'll talk about militarism as a flow of a certain kind of information. I'll talk about this as connected to power, not soft power, probably. Um, I look at Irene, because she'll talk about soft power. Not exactly meta power, either. <laughs> Um, and then I'm going to give some examples. Um, this is more a set of questions raising our attention to certain kinds of, of images that we see and our emotional response to them, the way in which we as knowing bodies engage with the world. This is a, a Chihuly uh, glass sculpture. It has nothing directly to do with what I'm talking about, except for this. It's a tangled mass of different tendrils and, and um, I don't know, little curly cues and everything that somehow seems a whole and yet there are individual strands in there. The metaphor that I want to use from this image is that we exist inside this kind of a tangled, multi-layered, uh, constantly changing, though this is static, but it, has the, it seems to be changing, set of, of flows of information. We live in a world in which everything comes to us as information, as data that our senses take in and that our bodies process, right? Information is fundamental. And imagine that this is a picture of information. If you have that idea of information, And you define information as a sign understood by a knowing recipient in a given context. This is sort of a typical information philosophy definition of information. There's, it has to be a sign, and it's in, understood by a knowing receiver of that information. Then you can define information about military things, where the content is military. Then the next step is to say, what's militarism? So I'm going to define militarism as tangled overflows of signs about military things moving into non-military contexts. To me, this is how you differentiate militarism from other things. They're not exclusive categories. We make differences, but they're differences in emphasis, not differences completely of kind. If you have an army and you have pictures of an army, you have reportage of an army, you expect to see military things, right? If, on the other hand, you're going about your daily life walking down the street in a, very, in a peace setting, you don't really expect to see military things. That's militarism over, military things overflowing into the everyday. And what happens to propel militarism through society? I'm going to su suggest that there's a kind of contagion effect and there's a kind of seduction effect. And these work on us as humans. To differentiate with nationalism, I want to go back to an older meaning of nationalism before it got its negative connotation. Nationalism, until very recently, has been understood as a sense of identity connected to, to a collect, 
to a collectively imagined community, borrowing from Benedict Anderson. We feel ourselves to be our nationality. Patriotism is the love of that nation, rooting for it, being fans, it's our team. Nationalistic sentiments, chauvinism, the kinds of things you see emerging in white nationalism, is the belief in the superiority of one's nation. I think by going back to these very basic definitions, we help untangle some of this, the, the uh, very difficult themes that are coming out in society today. If we understand information in these ways, information that is, that is a militarism, information associated with nationalism, with patriotism, and with chauvinism, then we can think about who's controlling the flow of this information. So when Russia preys on the chauvinists' attachment to extremist white nationalist images by pushing that information out, they're controlling the flow of information. A definition of power that's useful for capturing that kind of a dynamic is that power can be considered as happening in those instances when there is a control of the flow of information, with flow of information defined in terms of content, velocity, and access. Most important for talking about militarism, I think, is the emotional information content, the way in which emotion is embedded in the images that we receive. So what in the, what in the world does that mean? These pictures. This happened to me a couple years ago. I was minding my own business at uh, heading off for a trip at BWI. All of a sudden, I was part of a mini drama in which I was playing a bit part and was expected to play a bit part in a militaristic show. Now, I'm not saying this was bad or evil or in any way negative, but it struck me as a flow of information that was engaging my emotions and forcing me, essentially, to act in a particular way. It, an honor flight was arriving at our gate. Honor flights are organized tours of, of um, veterans from various places in the United States to Washington, D.C. to see the monuments. It's a good thing. As part of the honor flight's activities, the advertisement is a actually says on the website, you will be greeted by admiring citizens thanking you for your service. They promise that, and they deliver. Because the first thing they do is they've arranged to have service people um, line up as you're just exiting the plane to greet you. But they also hand out little flags to everybody sitting in the gate. And they tell everybody to stand up and applaud. Honor flight participants will experience the admiration and recognition of the public everywhere they tour in Washington, D.C. 
if you didn't stand, nobody was holding a gun to your head and making you stand, but if you didn't stand for at that moment, there would have been general opprobrium. And yet, at that moment, as these old guys in wheelchairs are coming out, you also really do feel admiration for them. You don't know whether they served honorably. You have no idea whether they sat, were a desk jockey for the entire war in which they served. But they served our country. And you feel this emotion. You caught the emotion from the moment. It came, if, if there were vapors, you could have seen it, right? Second example, CrossFit. You familiar with this, um, this gym, this exercise program? This is another, so the, the, the sort of the coda to the, to the uh, honor flight is it, it is an example of the way contagion of everybody actually ending up feeling like they want to thank all of, all of these strangers who are arriving. It normalizes the military and valoration of the military in everyday life. CrossFit does something similar. Even though CrossFit is founded by somebody without a military connection, it definitely invokes images of, of the military. For example, if you look at, do I have a, yeah. All right, I'll just point, it's better. The shield looks very much like a, I'm actually almost done, um, like, like, a, uh, like a military shield. Um, they have workouts of the day, and they often have workouts of the day memorializing a fallen soldier. Okay. Even the decor of the gym does this strange thing linking patriotism to the military, other military elements of things. This is very unusual. You don't see this in other countries. You don't see people decorating in the flag in other countries. So you have the, the red and, and blue stripes in the background of the picture. I think this is a kind of seduction, right? We are attracted to CrossFit in part because of it connecting us to a certain kind of ethos. The, the consequence of this sort of militarism in society is that it normalizes military action and that sometimes we end up with a militarism that is detached from our patriotic duties. And this is the example taken from an, Nicole Grove's work on violence entrepreneurs with people who are volunteering as independent um, fighters. Of course, this is not a new thing. We saw this in the Spanish uh, Civil War as well, right? But there, there, the new thing is the, way is, is the way the images are presented online for crowdfunding. Um, almost finally, uh, Nationalists also borrow the military imagery. Um, this is a uh, symbol of the American Freedom Party. Um, that's a white nationalist group. Again, it looks like a military patch. It also looks like images of patriotism that are geared towards keying into our emotions of affection for the country. Um, but then you have this picture down here. This is this group's newsletter. Um, and this image is both a worker, but a, a violent one. He's carrying a tool that is a weapon with a background of a flag, right? In conclusion, 
what we have with military images spreading into society is the accretion of micro instances of power. That doubles down and makes mili the military more normalized within civilian society. The digital economy, social media, as well as uh, websites for uh, encouraging various kinds of commerce and uh, non-commercial activity, spreads these images in a way that was not possible before the advent of digital technology. Militarization um, becomes mixed up with patriotism. Nationalism uh, has shifted in meaning to chauvinism, and it gets bundled in with militarization. And all of this leads to a naturalizing of military imagery in society. Thank you, Thank you Renee. I could help but think of the accidental patriotism as you gave this presentation with a red, white, and blue ribbon around your neck. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I had uh, earlier spoken to you about the journal Arts and International Affairs with which this, uh, if you'd like to fly a regard about a journal. Uh, in a way, there's a nice sort of a transition from what you were saying to what I'm going to say, uh, because in many ways the uh, the question I have is what do global cultural flows tell us about our interests and values and what can we do about them? But the one that I'm most interested in terms of examining global flows in arts is uh, uh, the power of art purportedly to produce a kind of a universal consciousness. And so I wanted to examine uh, what that might mean. So in some ways, it's kind of the other end of the spectrum about uh, images, in a way, asking us to come together and share a kind of a consciousness. And I'm, I was going to speak to uh, whether they do or they don't. Um, I've, in, in the journal, uh, I have an article called Art and the Global, uh, on which this is kind of a rejoinder. I thought that if I send this in, then within a month, I could think about how I would think about that Art and the Global in digital spaces. And I didn't quite get there, so I, I've deleted the in digital spaces <laughs> <laughs> myself. Uh, but maybe we can turn to that in the discussion because um, it clearly has implications for what we might do in, in digital space. And could you give me kind of a two, three minute warning? All right, so um, I think I'll have to look there because over here the image didn't change, but here it has. I've just come back, as I said, from Edinburgh. And Edinburgh, the city is known for its festivals. There are actually 12 Edinburgh festivals, of which the Edinburgh International Festival is the most famous because it was the founded, founding festival. Uh, it was uh, founded at the behest of many, but the one uh, lead authority, almost mentioned in heroic terms, is... Uh, um, uh, uh, well, you can't actually see his name there. This is an image of Rudolf Bing. He was a Jewish uh, refugee from Vienna. And so it's quite a poignant story told over and over again in Edinburgh that uh, a Jewish refugee from Vienna comes and he says, how can we make the world better? And his idea was that if people could convene around uh, sort of the principle of commensality, taking the common meal of art, and that in some ways you would be fostering uh, universal values. Um, that story has its fissures, one of them being that Bing Crosby was very good friends with Benjamin Britten. Benjamin Britten was looking for outlet for his operas, and so Edinburgh International Festival could stage his operas. And so while uh, Rudolf Bing, and later on he comes to the Met, uh, had um, um, uh, obviously, uh, uh, sort of the the war uh, and what it had done to him in his in his in, in in his social imagination. Yet he wasn't the kind of refugee that we might imagine as 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 having left us because he had already left his homeland. He was already living in the in the UK. Uh, it's important for me to point out those fissures in the story because I think that's where sometimes the 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 consciousness that we try to foster through universalism doesn't come through, and that that in a way universalism, I want to suggest, is uh, imbued with a language of cosmopolitanism, which is increasingly seen as elitist. 
And so Edinburgh International, for example, uh, although it was nominated for the Nobel Peace Prize, and uh, I think it's, uh, I would myself say, it's quite a heroic endeavor in the old and the new sense in terms of bringing people together and the power of art, uh, yet it's also the most elite of the Edinburgh festivals. Uh, the operas being staged at Edinburgh International, the symphony being played, they have to be pre-chosen, they must be success stories elsewhere before they are brought over to Edinburgh. Yet on the other hand, we do know that that uh, for me the heroic part comes from the fact that 73 million people had died in a war. And, and for people to have sat there and say, what can we do? This was part of that post-war thinking about what will bring people together. So the foundation of international institutions or the foundation of uh, cultural festivals, a story often not told by my colleagues in international relations, is precisely that, that there was this thinking about how would we convene culturally uh, to do these things. And UNESCO was probably the one endeavor in which people did think very clearly uh, and, and cogently I would argue, in terms of what, what would bring people together culturally. And the way war was understood in, uh, at UNESCO uh, was uh, as, as a cultural moment that it began in the wars of men. This was a, uh, 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 a line that was fashioned by poet laureate Archibald MacLeish from the US, borrowed by Clement Attlee in one of his speeches, and then borrowed over into the uh, preamble of UNESCO, that since war, wars begin in the minds of men, it is in the minds of men that the defenses of peace must be uh, constructed. Um, so while uh, uh, we have these kind of post-war reasonings and post-war moments of trying to bring people together through art, and I would argue, by the way, not argue, but we know UNESCO is much more than just the arts, but culture is a big part of UNESCO. Uh, where I want to take you with it is uh, what in a way led up to this moment in 1947 and then what has happened afterwards. Uh, so what leads up to this moment? I would say that this was part of that grand narrative in history that starts with, if I want to put a date on it, 1648, the Treaty of Westphalia, as opposed to the imagery in some ways, uh, Renee, that you were showing. I didn't know where you were going to go. But this is an image of the end of war. This is for, uh, uh, the Dutch master Bartholomew van der Hulst. He did a number of Amsterdam guard images and this is one of them but this is the signing of the Treaty of Münster and uh, so the treaty lies on the table the soldiers from both sides are defeated uh, the captain is shaking hands there's a drum John Vos's poem on peace is on the drum and it was a celebration of that peace uh, but it was much more than that because it was a celebration of color which the Dutch masters introduced it was a celebration of a new type of form because while this imagery was somewhat heroic it was about the end of war, not the beginning of war. So in a way, it was the opposite, in some ways, one might argue at that time, of militarism, which was a big moment uh, in, in the 17th century that you, could, you would have images of peace, of soldiers having not resigned themselves to peace, but that they're celebrating peace. So it's, it's part of that image in that art would celebrate that moment in a way can, you can see is the connection between uh, the, uh, the Rudolf being Edinburgh moment to this uh, Van der Helst-like moment. Um, and now my images are not moving at all, so I have to look there to see where it is next. Uh, in many ways, uh, that's reflected in the early international relations documents. If one can take François de Callier's uh, uh, book on, on the manner of negotiating with princes, still used in foreign services around the world uh, to talk about why diplomacy is so important. But what François de Callier is talking about is the permanent use of uh, uh, diplomacy in such a way that everyone is joined in a kind of a common commerce. This is a way of thinking of diplomacy as happening within a culture in which diplomacy is accepted. And so uh, in, in some ways these universal notions are attached to a culture of universalism. Uh, and, and, and so if you share in that culture, then you would think of diplomacy similarly as, as an endeavor in which, as François de Callier says, the actions of one can affect the actions of all others. This is also for us now the resurgence of the English school of, of uh, international society that has uh, uh, had a comeback now in, in international uh, relations. 
Um, I couldn't uh, make a presentation speaking of Edinburgh without bringing an image of Adam Smith, although I've been using this image of Adam Smith and somebody pointed out to me, you know that image of Adam Smith was a donation from Washington DC, which actually pleased me. Then I went and looked at who had donated. It was Cato Institute and many other places in Washington DC, which is okay, uh, but it wasn't such a Scottish image as I had thought it was. And uh, you know, Adam Smith is also speaking of commerce of our interactions as producing a moment in which there would be commensality. So where I'm going with this is that uh, these images are part of modern enlightenment thinking about if people share something they will get to know each other and if they get to know each other then we would have a culture of peace, we would have a culture of understanding, we would have a culture of cooperation. And where I want to take you with is where that, that understanding uh, begins to uh, break down. And this is just Alexis de Tocqueville reflecting a similar understanding as that of Adam Smith that trade leads to moderation, trade is the enemy of all violent passions, but underlying that idea of trade is is that same idea of commerce that uh, Adam Smith was speaking of, or François de Callier was speaking of uh, 80 years before Adam Smith in speaking of nations being joined in all necessary commerce. Um, so why doesn't it work? Uh, well, it doesn't work at, at the brutest level because our conflicts haven't subsided. Uh, whether or not we share in a common meal or not. I've just put up some images here. The North-South conflict uh, was raging at the same time that the Amsterdam, or in fact uh, the North-South conflict you could say uh, was beginning in some ways at the same time that Bartholomew van der Helst was uh, painting his images of the civic god. So while Europe was celebrating this perpetual peace, Europe was inflicting all sorts of violence upon a global South as it would come to be known as three centuries later. Uh, Later. So uh, I just have some images there of, of 300 years of thinking about that North-South conflict. One might also speak of the East-West conflict. Uh, that never subsided as a result of any kind of necessary commerce. I just have a paragraph there from Samuel Huntington's uh, uh, f famous thesis on clash of civilizations with a line drawn in there and saying where is the East and where is the West. But it's not just at the national level. This is in fact from a Edinburgh Fringe Festival production of Yal Farber's Nirbaya, which was based on uh, the very infamous and, and brutal and uh, very, very sad rape of an Indian woman in 2012 and, and Yal Farber, the South African playwright, pulled together a global cast to speak to uh, violence against women. Or over here you have images of uh, uh, the ethnic massacre in, in Rwanda. I've just picked these images at random to remind us that despite that universalism and despite the moment we've had conflicts on along with, with structural factors that didn't get addressed, race, uh, regionalities, uh, gender, etc. And we could go on with, with others. Uh, so, because I only have now four minutes left, let me speak to two possibilities that I explored in my work when I, I was leading an institute at Edinburgh called the Institute for International Cultural Relations. And Irene actually came and presented the early version of a model in Edinburgh on that. And I'm going to present on two things. One was a participatory exercise I did to explore why is it that we don't come together when we when we convene around artistic representations. And, and the other one was actually a study on, on soft power, partly inspired in some ways by the work that you were also doing. And uh, I'll skip over some of these images and go to those. Uh, so here are the results from the soft power study. And what we tried to do there was actually measure uh, uh, the effects of soft power and what was useful for me was to return to uh, because what is art? It is a sort of a soft power, it's a sort of a persuasion and and so as if it's a form of persuasion what does it do? Does it allow people to go across borders? Does it allow people to uh, convene with each other in other spaces? Does it allow for more commerce uh, and does it allow for international understanding say at the UN level? So we just used soft power values and the values for us were uh, uh, level of pluralism in a country, level of human rights uh, restrictions uh, or lack of them or um, um, uh, just prosperity of a country, their cultural institutions and we found some very strong correlations between that and what became our sort of 
influenced or the dependent variables which we measured in terms of uh, foreign direct investment, uh, number of tourists coming into the country, number of students coming into the country, and also if countries worked with you in the UN. And we found that there was something to this which was actually shocking for a number of us who worked on the study because we had not really taken Joseph Nye that seriously <laughs> until we did this in one model after no matter how we read our validity checks and our robustness checks etc it it yielded the same results the other study that I did at the more um, uh, grassroots level one might say was to convene together 33 global cultural fellows in Edinburgh to come from around the world they were situated in their communities around the world and we had a application process almost had 100 50 to 160 people apply and in the end we we'll end up taking 33 of them from around the world and we cu curated a program where people would go to various cultural events at the festival curated on particular themes. We worked with the festival directors and the big theme was cultural interests and values but in, in between that each day we explored a, uh, one theme or the other like cultural anxiety or high and lows in art or cultural wars or in fact one of the themes was art and the global which is the essay that I wrote which I'm presenting to you now and the idea was to have really e uh, extensive deliberations around, around this. So what I'm going to end with is a sort of a marketing film we produced around that program. No, it's just a minute and a half. Seventy years later, we have doubts. So every morning, we're debating, discussing, deliberating on the themes of global cultural interests and values. I think culture is important because culture is the human legacy. Culture is the lens through which we see the world. I always say that art and culture are my religion. Culture reflects people's uh, philosophy. Culture is important because we don't understand what it is. Sometimes people think dialogues is where we get along with each other. A dialogue includes multiple perspectives. But I want to disagree. We're debating, discussing, deliberating on those big issues, but inspired by events that have taken place in the festival environment. We learn at the university rather than the university imparting learning. It's a completely different way of thinking of education. We share challenges, we share fears, and, and of course, we share solutions. This is like the perfect environment in which to learn about humanity. And I think it's a step to build really good relations between nations through their cultures. This fellowship has been one of the great learnings in my life. So the University of Edinburgh really produced this as a marketing video, but what I want to get to is that there was no one thundering conclusion at the end as we all participated in the arts. What came out from it was pluralism, dialogue, conflict, uh, which doesn't sit that well with notions of universalism and cosmopolitanism. What it sits very well with is a uh, comfort with pluralism, which I would, I, I would still need to explore further, but it's not a comfortable moment in a world in which we are seeing militaristic images or nationalistic images or chauvinistic images or whatever the value might be. Uh, I would say that the breakdown of the art in producing a universal consciousness was because it was too linear, it was too grand, uh, and it was too cosmopolitan, cosmopolitan in an elite sense. The slides that skipped over were people who were sort of reflecting on Brexit and others as, as a kind of a shock, as a surprise, as something we couldn't have expected. But if you really go back in history, what I was suggesting was you can begin to see what led up to it and why we never really had the difficult conversations we needed to have around the production of Nirbhaya, around the production uh, uh, of, of elite images through Edinburgh International Festival versus some of the other festivals. So I'll leave you with that. Sorry for the technical. Well, um, thank you for this opportunity to uh, talk about my research. Um, I uh, teach at Georgetown University, but I'm also um, an analyst at the Federal Communications Commission. And I mention that just because I have to give this disclaimer that everything that I'm saying today is my own view and my own research and not a uh, reflection of the FCC or its, its, its members or its staff. Um, I'm going to talk about 
today some work that I've been doing to try to measure a country's soft power resources. Um, and soft power is, uh, you know, a country's cultural influence, how, uh, how successful it is in persuading other countries to follow its initiative. It contrasts with hard power, which I define as economic power or military power. And the thing that I bring to this uh, effort to measure soft power resources that's a little bit different is that I take the view of the audience rather than that of the performers. And this is something that coming out of political communications we do quite often. But in this case, in terms of soft power, I think of soft power in, when f foreigners think of us, do they think of us as we or as they? And that, for me, is the crux of what, what soft power is. And if that's what we're talking about, then to some degree we are, we are discussing the, how much um, different communities are integrated with each other. Um, also, if you think of soft power as a kind of international collective action where the members are nation states, then soft power is a kind of social capital that's built on trust. And um, in my work, I've leaned on the, the work on trust by uh, people like Eleanor Ostrom, where trust is really not simply uh, an art, uh, a matter of faith in other people, but it's uh, a matter of belief in others based on a history of interaction and reciprocity. So it it's, uh, has a, 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 hit, a grounding in actual interaction with, with others, including foreigners. So in reflecting on what kind of actions people take when they are expressing an interest in a foreign country, I came uh, up with four as a foundation. One is the easiest thing that uh, a person could do would be to watch a movie from a foreign country. And the most, uh, the biggest investment they could make would be to emigrate to that country with their family. So these are the four uh, 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 indicators that I began with. And the advantage of using these indicators as well is that there's data uh, from international institutions. So I have data from 1960 to 2015 for over 100 countries. Um, so um, it, it, with that data, you're able to begin to paint a picture of what a country's um, people's interactions with other countries has been over time. And it makes possible this comparison of soft power resources among countries and across, across history. Um, what I'm going to do today is uh, sort of take a stab at this from three different directions. First, I'm going to walk through some data that I developed earlier in the year comparing Russia and China to show you how the rubric can be used to look at soft power resources. Then I'm going to talk about two topics that I'm still working on and uh, in an exploratory stage, and I would love your feedback on them. The second is the um, uh, international education and how that connects to soft power, and third is of ideas at very early stages that I'm thinking about how to use this rubric to look at cultural festivals, including in-person participation and online participation. All right, um, this uh, uh, is the beginning of the comparison of Russia and China. Um, this is data on immigrants into Russia, um, what their countries of origin are. This is data on immigrants to China both the volume and their countries of origin. Now, all this data is online. Um, you can peruse the details uh, at your leisure. This is data on foreign students to Russia and China. And what I would say about this is that the bars are students that go to Russia. Uh, no, the bars are students that go to, um, uh, yeah, the bars are st students that go to Russia, sorry. And the, the, the line, the purple line is, um, foreign students going to China. And while in 2015, Russia and China are at comparable levels, you can see that China is coming from a very low base in the 1980s, okay? And there's a similar pattern comparing Russia and China here in terms of foreign visitors. Um, the bars here are China and the line here is Russia. The yellow bars uh, for China, those are our visitors from Hong Kong and Macau. So I've selected those out. So if it, for our purposes today, look at the purple bars. And again, you see that, there, that China is just coming from a, a lower base compared to Russia. And this is fo foreign audiences for movies produced by Chinese investors as compared to movies produced by Russia investors. I had to do a lot of contortions with the data to get this, so I encourage you to look at the details and give me any comments and corrections you would like. But to sum up, what this comparison of Russia and China show us is that in many respects, 
their soft power resources, their connections to other countries are very similar. Um, with the exception that Russia has far more foreign immigrants and has been more open to immigrants for much longer, um, and that China uh, has uh, is much has a much greater reach in terms of its movies. The other thing that you notice with the other two uh, indicators, visitors and students, is that the momentum is stronger with China because it's coming up from a lower base in the 1980s. Okay, so that gives you just a sense for um, what the soft power rubric can do. Um, the other thing that I would note with this comparison is really to connect it to JP's work um, in, in looking at soft power in his study for uh, the British Council is that looking at soft power in this way places a premium on a country's openness. And here it really is not just um, whether foreigners are interested in a particular country that uh, is uh, a, a, a boost to that country's soft power, but also whether that country is welcoming to foreigners. And I think that point actually has a lot of relevance for us in the United States today in terms of what, what position do we want to see the United States to be in in terms of soft power in the long run and what that means for how welcoming we are to foreigners. Okay, I'm going to move on to um, international education. In keeping with my uh, original note that I'm looking at soft power from the point of view of the audience rather than the performers, this is a graph that looks at which countries send the most students abroad for university education. I think usually when this analysis is done, it's focusing on the host countries, but just for today, we're gonna look at the sending countries, and these are the five, China, India, Germany, uh, uh, South Korea, and Nigeria. And if you look behind these numbers, there's, um, these are the countries that um, these five countries send students to. Um, in this social network graph, you can see that the United States and the United Kingdom are really at the center of this map. All five of these countries, these sending countries, send students to the United States and the UK. Along the top, you see uh, three countries that are recipients uh, from at least two of the sending countries. That's Australia, Canada, and Japan. And then there's a collection of other major countries. Uh, the Germans send a lot of students to other European countries, and Nigeria sends a lot of students to Ghana, Benin, and Malaysia. So this begins to give you a sense for, if you start to dig with this data, what kinds of relationships you might, uh, might, uh, uh, might cover. Um, one of the themes that I'm pursuing with this data is the relationship between soft power and hard power. Um, uh, preliminarily, it seems that hard power goes first and then soft power follows, but that maybe soft power is very sticky in a way. Uh, if we think about international education, during the Cold War, the United States and the Soviet Union both invested heavily in um, in encouraging foreign students to come to their universities as a way of developing um, uh, relationships with future elites. Um, if we go back a little bit further in time, those countries that had uh, um, were imperial powers and had colonies did the same in bringing people, um, elites from the colonies, to the center for university education. You see that with Japan uh, in, in, in Asia and also the UK in, in Europe. But if we ask us this question, uh, not every uh, co former colonial power is, is here. Uh, uh, most interesting for me is that France is missing, right? Um, so what's happening with France? So in a, in a global context where there are more and more university students in, a world, in the world, and a greater fraction of them are seeking um, uh, uh, education abroad, um, all these four countries, France, Australia, the United Kingdom, and the United States, experienced between 1970 and 2015 an increase in the number of foreign students who are coming. But here you see France is significant, but it's just not keeping up with the rate of growth as the others. I don't know why this is. If you have any, <laughs> if you have any insight into this, um, I'd be uh, interested in talking to you further. When you look at uh, France, um, uh, uh, where the foreign students come from. Um, this gives you a picture um, in order of the, the number of, of uh, foreign students to France uh, in 2015. It was Morocco, China, Algeria, Tunisia, and Italy. So an, an interesting collection uh, of, of countries there. Um, 
One connection to your militarism presentation is that with international education, one of the most interesting case studies that I came across was a book by Carol Atkinson called U.S. Military Soft Power. And she is someone who has a military background and studied what she believes is the success of the foreign officer training at U.S. military academies. And so um, she argues that um, the foreign officer military training at these academies is very successful in, create, in creating the conditions in those foreign countries for more plural uh, governments and for greater liberalization of political institutions. And she focuses particularly on the Arab Spring. She notes she has a statistical study that shows that those countries that had a, a strong military exchange relationship with American academies, those mil foreign militaries were more likely when given a choice of protecting the people or supporting the leader, tended to protect the people more. And those that didn't uh, tended to side with the leader. So that is a very interesting, very detailed case that I would commend to you if you're interested in that subject. Turning now to um, cultural studies, I have all these wonderful maps in the background. I thought I would give you a chance to actually look at one without putting a, a plain old Excel graph <laughs> on top of it. So. Um, a new area for me is to think about cultural festivals. Um, I, uh, in reflecting on people's identities and what affects their personal view of other countries, I think those of us who've had the opportunity to go to international events and conferences find that interaction with foreigners from other countries very influential in cementing in our, our, our idea of that country. Um, and The, uh, the advantage of looking at cultural festivals, which I think of as religious festivals, sports events, cultural festivals, things like the Edinburgh Festival, uh, the World Cup, uh, the Olympics, the Hajj, I would be very interested in studying, is that um, there are the performers, the players at the center, and that the people who are participating in person, and then there are people who are participating in a mediated way, usually through television. And then today, there's this broader audience of people participating through social media. And each of these, it would be possible to get national participation data. And we might be able to see whether the so social media participation is simply a replication of what's in person, or is it different? Um, so very preliminarily, I have some uh, quick statistics on the scale of these events. This is for Edinburgh Festival, um, uh, which is quite, quite large, and the Hajj, which is enormous. And then for the sports, I have Olympics and uh, the World Cup. Um, um, another uh, area that I'm very interested in exploring with this soft power uh, data is what is the role of public diplomacy? And in the previous examples, the role of public diplomacy recedes into the, recedes into the background. But with cultural festivals, I think there might be a, a greater, uh, a clearer through line of what the, the uh, what we intuitively understand as the connection between public diplomacy and soft power. And so I'm hoping to explore this further, and I would uh, appreciate your, your uh, comments and suggestions. Thank you. Thank you, Irene, and thank you to Renee as well, and thank you to all of you. So I guess we have a few minutes, if I can invite my colleagues, to have a discussion, entertain comments, reflections. effect of the internet on uh, academic exchanges, which countries have participated most and benefited most, so, and how does that affect the international student so um, my understanding is that the there is just continu there is continuous been continuous growth in the number of foreign students who are interested in studying abroad um, if you take the global total. Um, it's not clear to me if, for example, online education is uh, is cutting into that or decreasing the numbers in uh, in any way. There's a broader effect that um, the degree to which the global economy is shifting from an industrial economy to a knowledge economy, the premium uh, benefit to the students 
of getting a good university education and learning the particular skills that they want to learn is greater. And that is the reason that the uh, scholars in the education literature say that um, there's a growth in, in uh, study abroad more broadly. I'm sorry, I'm not familiar with the Bologna process. Is that related to the Erasmus program? No, it was the process which would harmonize accreditation and programs across Europe because they were so different from each other. And Erasmus was connected to it because in some ways that was the, the European-wide program which would send students from one country to another. And there are almost one million mm -hmm. Erasmus students now. And uh, I, I think that has gone forth in that there hasn't been uh, accreditation for all European universities, but there's more of an understanding of, you know, the, the, from the, at least from the Brussels level in terms of what universities, what courses could be. It also allowed universities to partner with each other. So in fact, the program I was creating at the University of Edinburgh, uh, I would partner with the University of Siena. And what was going to facilitate was that Bologna process. So, uh, and it, it's been a huge question after the Brexit vote in, in uh, UK, because UK was, seen as sort of then your statistics sort of bear that out as the leader in terms of the recipient of students, et cetera. And, uh, and so how would post-Brexit then cater to, uh, I don't know where the, where the negotiations went on education, but my understanding was that it had been proceeding in terms of recognizing each other's coursework and also harmonizing it in such a way that, uh, like in the US, you know, we, we have certain start of a semester and end of a semester in all universities. And I actually have a question mm -hmm. related to, I didn't see an arrow between UK and US, but those are some of the highest number of American students from, yeah. for UK or yeah. from the US. So remember the first graph was that we are only focusing on students sent from the top five. So that's how I made that cut. Otherwise the, uh, the network is just too um, con convoluted to understand. So in that, network analysis graph. We were only looking at Chinese students, Nigerian students, the, whatever the top five. Line between Germany and Switzerland or France and Switzerland. Germany is one of the top five sending ah, countries, right. which is very interesting. Oh, yeah, oh, that they're not oh, that oh, large a population, yeah. but many of their students go out. Oh, cool. Yeah, okay. Um, I have a question for okay. you too. Okay. So when I looked at Russia and China uh -huh. um, and their movies, uh -huh. The thing that popped into my head was diaspora. Uh -huh. And um, like, I don't know if Ren Ren Shah, if his movies, because he made a gazillion Chinese movies. This is, I, I have like one factoid about Chinese movies that I know. <laughs> um, it, but he was really, I think, from like Singapore or something, but he moved to Hong Kong, and I don't know if his movies count for China, but clearly he was producing them for a diasporic community. and. The Russian diaspora isn't that isn't like the Chinese diaspora. Okay, so um, uh, the movie data is very complex, and I cannot pretend that I've plumbed the depths. I would say that if you look at the titles uh, for that graph for the China uh, produced movies, you might not recognize them as Chinese. They might look like Hollywood movies to you, but in fact, the investment does come from China. So my tentative. Uh, um, explanation would be that China media movie investors are really uh, trying to enter that blockbuster market and their initial foray is not to produce Chinese cultural movies but just to go for the global blockbuster. By contrast, the Russian movies, the, that foreign audience for the Russian movies, many of them are in former Soviet states. So that's not necessarily diaspora, but there's a cultural affinity there. And you would recognize those movies as Russian, culturally. So it's an interesting, mm -hmm. uh, it's an interesting question about what do you want to know from the data? And you might sort your movies out differently. Uh, are yeah. the, the Chinese movies in Chinese? No, no, no. They're in English. Yeah. They're, they're, they're Blade Runner. <laughs> the, yeah. Yeah, right, 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 right. That's right. an interesting <laughs> anecdote in terms of diaspora yeah. in Bollywood. Uh -huh. the, Indian diaspora is much more limited than the audience for Bollywood or uh, Indian films, because Bollywood is just the Hindi language cinema in India. 
but then when uh, the there were lots of changes to the Indian film industry, and and one of the the economic things that emerged in the early 2000s was that uh, one week run for a Bollywood film in New York would fetch as much as six to eight months of a full house in India because the returns were greater. So and the narrative changed in the cinema. The narrative arc began to change. Bollywood films, even regularly that are seen in India, now have people who've gone abroad. Right. And, and so the film is taking place in New York or Canada or UK. But part of it was the economics of, of, of catering to the market. And that, of course, and then the Indian government picked up on, you know, the, Gandhi was very much against cinema. He thought it was as bad as cigarettes, alcohol, and all kinds of vices. So uh, the Indian film industry didn't have an industry status until 1999. But now you now here is in India, which has taken full charge of Indian cinema as India's soft power. Mm -hmm. So part of, I think, this soft power mm -hmm. equation is where countries begin themselves to see value in these mm -hmm. cultural values. The only other thing I would add, and I, I thought mm -hmm. here's another way we could perhaps talk and connect mm -hmm. is, and this came out not so much from our data models, but from the deliberations that we held in Edinburgh, mm -hmm. that while we can't talk about universalism and cosmopolitanism as the values that you always get as a result of interactions, what was coming out was that interactions around festivals, interactions around study abroad experiences, it's a very intense, mm -hmm. and they open us to conversations we wouldn't have otherwise mm -hmm. had mm -hmm. about ourselves, about who we are, who the other person mm -hmm. is. Mm -hmm. And so it came up over and over in the discussions while people disagree, they say, well, this allowed us to have this conversation. Mm -hmm. you know? So I think if there's a universalism to art for me, it's in that, mm -hmm. that, it op that you're standing in a ticket line or you're coming out of a theater and you're able to reflect on an experience with a complete stranger mm -hmm. about something, a conversation that you, would, you wouldn't have otherwise had. And I really like the way you sort of, in some ways, went through this, the intensity of the experience from just mm -hmm. having a meal to watching a movie mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. you know, things like mm -hmm. that. Yeah, I wanted to thank you for your excellent presentations. So all of you actually really tell, looked really in depth of like image, art, and education. So have you done any studies on the outcome of soft power? If you assume these are the, they are powerful. So, like, what's the in, in effect? So, I actually don't think that the way I look at power is as soft power. I think um, I think soft power and hard power assume that the actors exist, and I actually look at a relationship in which the actors emerge. Um, it's kind of a way of saying there's power where A is doing something to B, and that's a perfectly fine way of, of looking at hard power or soft power. And there's power by looking at the arrow between A and B. And that's what I'm trying to do. I look at what flows between some A and some B. They may not have existed before, you know the 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 white nationalist group may not have may not have been an actor prior to being able to project these images online but i think what we share especially on this the sort of the soft power and the way i'm looking at it is is saying you know what what is it about these images and in terms of outcomes, actual empirical evidence, I mean, em empirical conclusions. I don't work like that. I'm not a positivist or a neo-positivist. Even though you took all these quant courses at MIT. Yeah. <laughs> but what I really learned was how often the, the, um, the assumptions of the statistical models are violated. Um, but what, what I do is I look at, at empirical evidence. I look at images and I look at what people do and I, I ask questions and, and search for answers that fit in a pragmatist way. Um, with that, so I've looked at, I, I'm just beginning this uh, approach to militarism. 
And can you trace a line? I think you can. I don't think I've yet written the, the compelling argument for that. But when I finish writing that, it will be a tentative suggestion of the way in which militarism moves through society. And I have to keep coming back to my conservative friends and saying, what do you make of this? Do, does this just sound like a you know liberal, you know, democratic hack job against the military? Or, or do you actually see the differences and the subtleties that does it make sense, right? So it's contingent and contextual. Okay. Um, so um, there are two studies that I've come across of soft power that quantitatively look at whether countries with soft power achieve these effects in international discussions. And one of them is cited in this paper, which I gave out. It's the Goldsmith and Horiuchi. They look at uh, Gallup uh, uh, polls and um, examine whether the United States was able to get support on three things. Uh, um, support on in the invasion of Iraq, um, also um, uh, support in the inter uh, International Criminal Court, and one other thing, which which uh, escapes my mind. But the conclusion was that the soft power of the United States was very effective in, pers in, in influencing countries on major issues, major issues that the general public of a foreign country would be aware about. But when you start to get to things like the International Criminal Court and the other thing, which I can't even remember, it was too technical and it seemed like the US soft power, the public opinion, foreign public opinion, had no effect. So there is that kind of precedent for doing that kind of uh, statistical work. The other thing is the, the uh, uh, book that I mentioned by Carol Atkinson. So that is both a qualitative and a quantitative analysis of all these countries that have um, uh, international um, um, tr uh, military training with uh, the US military academies and the effect on particularly the, 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 the results of the Arab Spring. So I would commend those two to you. Yeah. The Carol Atkinson study was very useful for us as well. Oh, and yeah. also uh, Andrew Rose's study, which was not on soft power, but Andrew Rose is basically arguing that we'll trade with countries that we like. And he had an affinity index and actually showed that countries we like, we like to trade with. And then he controls for a whole host of sort of factors born out of international trade theory, new trade theory, and old trade theory, and shows how the countries that we like is over and above the, uh, about what comparative advantage would. I would, I know I'm uh, tooting my own horn, but our study was trying to do precisely that. And there's a issue here which is very important, a lot of, and, 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 and I think Irene has done a brilliant job in separating some of these effects, that a lot of the studies of power uh, are post hoc ergo propter. There's a problem of endogeneity also in them. You say, okay, Britannia is number one. UK often emerges as number one in terms of countries being liked, but it includes the effects as well as values of the UK, so you don't know what caused what. So then you can't take those soft power indices that exist and use it for anything because it's got causes and effects buried into it. So what we tried to do in our study was to separate the two, and that's why we went to Joseph Nye's definition, thinking it wouldn't work, because to him, soft power is is about values that a country has and we thought how would we measure those values and if we were able to measure it how would we show the effects of those values so we measured the values in terms of what he was saying as the attraction of a country, that they're pluralistic, that they're prosperous, that they have cultures that people are attracted to. So we took proxies for those variables. We looked at, that's why we looked at the Freedom House Index or the Polity 4 Index, and we looked at just GNP data. And for cultural institutions, we looked at how many countries does a country have its cultural institutions in? So how many countries is the British Council in? How many countries is the Goethe Institute in? Or Confucius Institute? And they're very crucial measures because for example Confucius Institute is not just if they have one country it means one country with maybe 100 campus programs in the US and then we try to see the effects in terms of does this lead to more students more foreign direct investments so those are the effects that you're talking about but I would add that having done it and although it surprised us that these effects were so strong uh, where they were the weakest were for two things. One was tourism, 
people don't care where they go as tourists. So all, uh, we didn't, for example, find for tourism the polity variable to be statistically significant. So in other words, I'm going to go to whichever country because they, I just want to go there regardless of whether there's an authoritarian system there or not. Um, so that was one. And the other place where we found, and that was in terms of independent variables, the other place was, oh, oh sorry, was uh, the UN general, vo UNGA voting. That countries are finding it hard to persuade each other just because they have soft power to vote for them. And so I'd be interested in the study you mentioned because it seems to get around that. Thank you for coming. Thank you.